Welcome to the Barrier Breakdown, Disrupting Mental Health Podcast, where we talk about the clinical and practical issues that face those working in the mental health industry. everyone and welcome to this week's episode of The Barrier Breakdown. My name is Erin Melano bailey Chief Operating Officer at Cognitive Behavior Institute, and my co-host, Dr. Kevin Caridad, CEO and owner at Cognitive Behavior Institute. On this week's episode, we have two very special guests, Christine Michaels and Nikki Dawson, both of NAMI Keystone, Pennsylvania. Christine Michaels is the CEO of NAMI Keystone, Pennsylvania, and is a mental health administrator with over 30 years of experience in case management and mental health services. In addition to overseeing the day-to-day operations at NAMI Keystone, PA, Chris also serves on a number of committees in Allegheny County and across the state that address mental health. Nikki Dawson is the Director of Advocacy at NAMI Keystone, Pennsylvania. In her role, Nikki participates in a number of coalitions and reviews state and federal legislation that impacts mental health, keeping supporters informed and connected with their policymakers. She also oversees the Adult Mental Health Advocacy Program, which helps individuals understand their rights to make informed decisions about their care. So ladies, thank you both so much for taking the time, uh, both Nikki and Chris, for joining us here on the Barrier Breakdown. For our listeners who may not be familiar, could you please start our conversation today with telling us a little bit more about what NAMI is? Well, NAMI's the the largest um, grassroots organization in the country uh, that serves uh, families and individuals affected by mental illness. Um, They have uh, an organization, a state organization in, in every state, and we're the state organization for NAMI. NAMI Keystone PA. We have 31 chapters or affiliates in in the state, across the state, and we serve as the hub for communication, technical assistance, um, coordination for uh, a lot of like collaborative activities. Okay, great. Wonderful. Yeah. And, okay. and what are, and when you mention your roles at NAMI, Sorry, Kevin, I'm very interested in this topic. Um, What regarding advocacy can um, direct practice clinicians, why should they care about advocacy? Why is that, why should that be important to them? Well, we, we, we're prepared to talk about that. (laughs) Um, And well, we think about it in two different ways. We think about it in, in personal and professional behavior and then legislative and, and, and federal type of um, systems advocacy. So I'm gonna talk about personal and professional behavior. And in terms of, of being a, a, a therapist or a, a, a counselor, um, we think about uh, of person uh, first language, people first language, Um, We think that's the number one thing that you could do as an advocate to talk about the person first and the disorder or the diagnosis second. In other words, you're talking about someone who has schizophrenia, not referring to your patients or your clients as schizophrenics or, or, uh, you know, talking about them as they're bipolar. They have a bipolar disorder. Okay. Or, or they have bipolar. Um, also, um, we think about uh, the language that you use outside of the office. In other words, your professional behavior, your personal behavior rather, should be you're not one way in the office and outside of the office, you're another way. It should be all the time, your personal behavior. And that includes your vocabulary. Um, we, we advocate that you would not use words like crazy, psychotic, whack job, to use any type of describing anything. And we consider that anti-stigma language. In other words, you do not perpetuate the language that would perpetuate stigma. Um, In terms of professional behavior, and this is is ways that you personally can be an advocate. Um, We we like to see that you practice practice client-driven services, client-driven service plans, the client is driving their service plan, um, that, uh, that you are well-versed in services and supports, um, that supportive plan that you're working with them on, 
um, that you're able to advocate for them in getting and in, in obtaining those services and supports. Um, also that your plans are recovery focused. And when we say that, we mean that, that you believe that they can recover from their disorder or their diagnosis, that they have the ability, that you believe that they have the ability to develop the coping skills or the, uh, the, have the ability to, to uh, I learn about their illness and uh, develop those skills to manage and live with that illness and uh, achieve a, a, a productive and happy, happy life. Um, and, um, and with that, um, I'm going to turn it over and let Nikki talk a little bit about like some other ways that you can advocate. So um, I am Nikki Dawson, the Advocacy Director in Army Keystone PA, and one of the very first things I want to talk about, um, simplest tools that we have to advocate not only for ourselves, but our clients as well, our right to vote. So um, I can't stress that enough. Your right to vote impacts everything from your local community, your council representatives, all the way up to the President of the United States. Um, and it's important to vote in every election, not just the presidential election. The elections in between the presidential elections are usually the more impactful to um, your sphere of influence, if you will. Another way to get involved is visit your Congress people, visit your council, take the time to speak to your mayor, your county commissioners, um, email those people, let them know what's going on in your life, what's going on in your clients lives, how maybe they can assist you in helping, you know, to better the situation for everybody. And action alerts. We have a very active action alert um, program, if you will, that I, I, I'm in charge of. And usually monthly, at least, um, sometimes twice a month, we send out action alerts. And that's a call to action to our grassroots advocates and our volunteers for them to reach out to their senator, senator, excuse me, to their legislature to advocate for themselves and, and others um, on a particular issue. And of course, all of that ties back into the clinical side of what we do and how we can affect change for our clients because um, it's not just mental health policy that affects, you know, those that we serve. It's um, SNAP benefits policy. It's um, the 988 legislation that's coming out. That, that's going to affect not only the individuals that we serve, it's going to affect law enforcement. It's going to affect, um, you know, physical health, if you will. So very important. Can you speak more about that? Uh, to, to the clinical side of public policy? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, I will say that HB 55, House Bill 55, currently in, in the Pennsylvania House, is um, a piece of legislation that when you think about it in general, it's not going to impact us too much. However, it seeks to amend the Constitution of Pennsylvania so that the governor would not be able to declare emergency declarations beyond 21 days and that it would require a Pennsylvania congressional approval to do that. So how that affects us um, on the mental health service side is that it would take away the moratoriums that um, are currently allowing us to use telehealth. It would take away, um, again, moratoriums that affect our the people that we serve as far as rent and utilities are concerned. Um, just things of that nature. You know, there's also the stimulus things that are happening right now. There's the unemployment, extended unemployment benefits, compensation. Um, also something simple as being able to get in there on time to get your ID renewed. That, you know, things of that nature have also been pushed a little further out because of the pandemic. So taking away the governor's ability to declare those emergency declarations has the, um, the ability to impact many services across multiple systems. Thanks for that. You know what, the biggest population is typically listening to our podcast are the providers, the clinical providers. And so, you know, some of the things that uh, I know I'm hearing concern about and I have concern about is uh, like you said, the telehealth laws. You know, Pennsylvania, it's my understanding, as of last I checked, we don't have any telehealth laws. And insurance companies kind of can either cover it or not cover it. And I know there are some insurers that were and now all are, as well as Medicaid and Medicare are where there were a lot more restrictions prior to this uh, state of emergency. 
uh, that you had to get special waivers, quite quite the, the barriers there. What are you hearing on both the state and federal level, uh, if anything, to even if even when normalcy comes, that uh, allowing those barriers to go away and allowing us clinicians to be able to get to those vulnerable populations in a much easier way? What are you What are you hearing? As far as Medicaid goes, the the state, um, the Office of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services, did a lot of um, a lot of work. Um, to uh, support that the that the waivers and the the uh, regulations that were waived during the the pandemic remain waived, and that CMS um, is looking at, at at doing that. I mean that that was the um, that was the position of of most all of the states. They wanted those regulations to stay waived and and the uh, and the and the case, the position that was presented was that it really um, improved the no-show rate um, drastically uh, across Absolutely. the state it, in Pennsylvania. Um, and they had the data to prove that, uh, to substantiate that. So, um, and uh, I believe, but I'm not positive, but I believe that there, there has been some movement perhaps in this last um, stimulus package that supports some some uh supports telehealth and and um the some relaxing of those regulations those cms regulations i i i, I think i think um i think the our our national organization put put something out about that um we get tons of information from our national organization it's a little bit hard to keep up with but but it is on it is on their radar um, telehealth. It's on everybody's radar to, 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 um, it was, it was so well received by everybody. The only, the only, only ones that had some difficulty was, with it, I believe, were the commercial payers <laughs> that, that were having some problems with it and, and not so totally, you know, in, in, in favor of it. So, can you speak more to that? What you what you're referencing that the commercial insurers had some problems. What what were the concerns? Uh, I'm not exactly sure. I just heard that they they were they. I don't know if it was the fact that they. I don't know. I I in your interpreted opinion, what do you it, think it is? In your opinion, what do you think it is? Uh, I would always when I hear commercial payers don't don't favor something, I assume it's because they don't want to pay that they had to pay more. Okay. So I. And is so it at the federal be, level or the state level that you're hearing that or both? State. It is it, it, within the state with, that we heard it. I got you. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because the two at least major payers here in Western PA, which are both Highmark, was paying for telehealth beforehand. Yes. Uh, UPMC has re released a statement that they have policy in place for mm -hmm. uh, use of telehealth prior to the pandemic. And so my assumption is that they're going to continue. Um, it's interesting to see which payers would be giving resistance. I think I want to make a distinction, though, between uh, behavioral health and physical health. And I think it's the physical health providers that are having the problem with it. Oh, okay. Not the, not the behavioral health providers. Oh, that's good. Thank the you payers. That. The commercial, private, commercial insurers, physical health. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah, we definitely are of the mindset that we feel like the pandemic actually catapulted behavioral health care via a virtual platform uh, 10 years ahead of what maybe would have taken us to get yes. there without the pandemic. And yes. you can't, it's sort of like a bell. You can't unring it once it's happened. Right. Uh, we've seen the phenomenal impact that uh, breaking down barriers of access to care, even within your state, you know, because there's such a shortage of behavioral health both clinicians, but not only that, but medication providers when it comes mm -hmm. to psychiatrists and nurse practitioners, physician assistants. So to be able to deliver that quality of care to people all across the state in which you are licensed and to not have to, you know, get in your car, drive, 
you know, 30 minutes to an hour each way, sit in traffic, cancel for a number of reasons. If your kids are sick or you don't have a babysitter or any of that, that's all broken down all those barriers when it comes to just hopping on your computer in a, in a HIPAA compliant platform. And we've also seen, and I'm sure you could understand this too. The cancellation rates have dropped significantly when it comes to um, better engaging in care on a regular basis. So those are all things that we are hoping um, for to continue um, beyond the pandemic so that we can continue to, you know, get the care to the people who need it the most. Do you have any ideas how behavioral health clinicians or even psychiatrists, nurse practitioners, anyone in the, in the behavioral health space could advocate for, you know, those coverages if they, you know, tend to be, um, I'll call it set retroactively with some of the other insurers. I know Aetna was one that kind of only allowed it because of the pandemic or more of the Medicare, you know, population. Yeah, I'm, I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I, I'm aware that UPMC and Highmark both are, you know, in favor behavioral health wise in, in, in particularly UPMC and community care and, um, we're we're very aware of that of their being in favor of it and supporting it. Um, uh, as far as like like I said, the physical health piece, I I the, it it dawned on me what I was saying to you about not being in favor of it that it was the physical health insurers and and I'm not sure um, you know I'm not sure what what to say about that. Um, I, I would mean, imagine. I, one of your strategies I heard is having consumers uh, reach out to their legislators. Clinicians are the same; can do the same thing because it seems yeah. like this is a. It's there's everybody's going to be on the same page. Consumers, clinicians. I'm hoping the insurers because we know behavioral health being addressed and integrating with primary care improves overall outcomes. So I don't see how there could be any resistance to not providing yeah. it. They're, they're just I mean, there. I think it's I I th- well I know that the um. I know that the physicians, the organizations and that are all in favor of it. I mean, I, I, I think there's way more, you know, uh, support for it a- across the board than there is any, any, anybody that's, you know, opposing it. I mean, and I, I think it, it I think, you know, I, I, we haven't heard anything. I don't think negative about it, Nikki. Right. I mean, I think it's all been in, in favor and positive and yeah, absolutely. Um, I um, think they're, I think, preferred by you know, providers and consumers. Yeah. I think we're, I think our, like a, our providers organizations are, are anticipating it, it continuing and, and that it going in a very favorable condition. I mean, in a direction. I got so. you. Okay. You know, one of the other things I think about with psychiatry is the Ryan Haight Act and uh, in a sense of controlled substances that oftentimes have to be part of a treatment plan and how that can get in the way where it's currently waived, I think, until the end of the month. I don't know if it'll be extended. Do you have any thoughts about that, particularly getting access uh, to psychiatry across the state of Pennsylvania. I hear a lot of people, particularly on the east side as well as west, and then one is how do you get to a psychiatrist? And when you can get to them, you have to wait uh, half your life to get in. Uh, and then oftentimes, uh, there are many psychiatry are cash only, particularly on the east side, I'm, I'm hearing. So there's a lack of it. And so, you know, when you look to trying to reach people to get treated properly, it's becoming very difficult, partic- both on the psychotherapy side, but also on the medical management side. What are your thoughts? Have you heard anything about the Ryan Haight Act and addressing that after post-pandemic as far as access uh, and any other thoughts you have? I'm not familiar with the Ryan Haight Act um, as far as controlled sub- or controlled, yeah, controlled substances go. Um, that That's less of my wheelhouse, if you will. Yeah. Um, I'm not familiar with it either. Could you in, enlighten us. <laughs> sure. Uh, Aaron, do you have any, any feedback? Sure. So from our understanding, it's that um, in order to prescribe controlled substances, the person has to be seen in person for an evaluation versus okay. just over a virtual platform. But it's our understanding that as you know, virtual care expands and takes off, and also given the COVID world we've been living in, that wasn't possible for people who were new clients. Um, so having that initial um, initial appointment and that initial relationship face-to-face 
versus, uh, you know, via a HIPAA compliant platform virtually in order to prescribe a controlled substance. And that was allowed during the pandemic. It's currently so waived. They, they currently waived it. Waived. Okay. Yes. I, I, we know for a fact, um, as part of the OMSAS Mental Health Planning Council, Office of Mental Health and Substance Abuse, we were tasked or in a group tasked with gathering data as far as wait times, um, client and provider experiences throughout the pandemic. And the data that we gathered reflected a wait. Even though we're in a telehealth world, people are still waiting three weeks to more than three months even for an initial appointment. And then you get to the comment section where we allowed for open-ended answers. And yeah, they get that first appointment and they're waiting three weeks to three months. But after that, it could be months and months and months. And there's no support offered in between. Um, High on the list was wait times for counselors and therapists. Right below that was psychiatrists and followed by peer, peer services peer support services. So um, even though telehealth has opened a lot of avenues for treatment, there there are still significant ways across the Commonwealth to receive that. Yeah, you know, I think it's very reflective of what we're seeing even on our practice side. We also did a a podcast prior with Doug Henry from Allegheny Health Network. Uh, And really what we're seeing is just uh, an explosion of need that was growing prior to the pandemic that just basically lit a match under it. And so, you know, what I would say, we always took pride in our clinic side, uh, being able to get clients in the same week. Uh, We're lucky to get uh, uh, psychiatry individuals in within three weeks. Uh, But therapy, I mean, we're getting several hundred calls a week. And even though we have 50 something therapists, it's hard to fill that gap. And then we refer elsewhere, then they fill. So it's a lack of, it sounds like, number of clinicians at this point. It's in it, it, in I, I did an interview for, with a, 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 a reporter from a, a rural, mid, mid central Pennsylvania um, and uh, regarding this particular issue. And she had somebody contact her and said that they were waiting like close to 18 months to see a psychiatrist. Yeah. And, and, and the more we talked, um, I, I ended up like, it, trying to find out, I, I ended up concluding during the conversation, I really think that that the people who have private insurance are waiting longer than the people who have medical assistance. Mm-hmm. I think the people who have medical assistance are are getting seen sooner than the than the people who have private insurance. I, I really do. I think people with private insurance are waiting longer. Um, just because there there are certain regulations that that medical assistance the medical assistance companies um, have to meet and 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 sometimes they're not meeting them but there's um, there's justifications for that uh, just because there's a shortage but um, nevertheless they're they're not people are not waiting eighteen months you know. You know, as I hear you bring up the Medicaid, one other interesting thing that I think may, could potentially be a barrier. I've, uh, I'm also the Southwest Division Chair of the NASW, kind of in, down the home stretch here. Uh, in July, I'll be out. But that said, is I've had someone reach out to me uh, about themselves as well as a few other therapists. These are therapists kind of in uh, single or just a couple of therapists within the group. They mm-hmm. take Medicaid. But what's happening to them and they're struggling with to continue on seeing that population is from the, at least what they reported. This is third party now that they said is that uh, the documentation that's needed, if some things are just off like a date because, or something, they're clawing back money. So these individuals or these groups, when they get clawed back 15,000, 8,000, they're not going to take that risk anymore. So they're beginning to pull out. Uh, have you heard any of this? And what are your thoughts about that? No, what I haven't heard that. What I heard recently is that um, that they're having difficulties getting into the network, and and that they're they don't understand why that it's it's too hard to get in in get approved to get into the network. Um, and is that across the state, or is it particular counties? Um, I'm trying to think where. Where I where who asked me to look into that? If it was here 
locally or I don't remember. I don't remember if it came from a crust. We get, I get, I can't say. <laughs> I, I don't, I, cause it's, it could come from any, anywhere in the state. I'm, I'm not quite sure, but that was the question um, that somebody asked me if I could look into it. Had I heard anything um, about, about providers wanting, they didn't understand it was a member, a NAMI member, family member asking because they didn't understand if there was a shortage of of practitioners, why they weren't able to get why 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 people practitioners were having a hard time getting into the network when people needed them. You know, there was such great need. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't making sense. So my personal experience here in Western PA and Aaron can fill in the gaps and we won't be specific about anything, but uh, is at, a t at one particular time, there's a process of getting both in network with it, getting getting a promise number so yeah. that it's the key for billing and then going to the county level, allowing you to get into any one network. Yeah. And oftentimes my, our experience at one point is that counties would be restricting saying they only need social workers or they're full at the moment. Yeah. Uh, and so it really wasn't on the therapist side. And I don't know. I wonder if we went back to utilization again. Uh, the other thing I, I, I we heard from uh, one particular leader within uh, a, a particular county is they were concerned about, uh, I don't know if I have this wrong, about having too much providers diluting the pool within that county so that the current uh, groups that are there wouldn't have enough clients. Mm -hmm. And it didn't stand up to me at the time because uh, we had clients calling us all the time all around. And they would, and we were not able to get in. Uh, yeah. So it's just interesting with that dynamic of all that going on. I uh, yeah, I, I spent over twenty some years as a provider before I came to NAMI to work. So mm -hmm. I'm very familiar with the Medicaid system and the networks and the county's approval system and everything. So I understand what you're saying perfectly. Um, but I didn't. I haven't had any opportunity to to investigate what 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 they were presenting to me to to know. To, but that's the only that's the only thing I've heard about. So another challenge that we were running into, um, and I'm not sure if it still exists, but back when we were say we were able to get in with the county, the state was taking about 13 months to process the promise number applications. Yeah. And if you're a new clinician opening up in private practice, your caseload is likely going to be full 13 months later by the time you're able to accept this insurance. So mm -hmm. that was also another barrier where you know, it was really a shame that um, it was taking that long to get into, to get the state promised ID number. And then as a result, a lot of clinicians weren't interested in joining by, you know, that time because their caseloads were full at that time. Yeah. Yeah. When was that a couple of years ago or? Yes, it was. Correct. Yeah. Yes. They were, cha yeah, they were, they were, they were delaying, they were given even like, established providers a, 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 a hard time. They were changing things over. It was it was a hard time for everybody, for everybody. But yeah, at one point we changed our address and they said it would take about six to eight months. And so what do you do with those clients? I yeah, they say, said they couldn't be seen until our address was updated, but it was gonna take six to eight months to, to update it. <laughs> I, will, I will thank uh, Governor Wolf's office at the time who made that three weeks. Uh, they were very helpful. Uh, but, but uh, you know, and it's because we wouldn't take no for an answer and not everybody has the resources like we did at the time to, I should say, yeah. uh, to follow up like that. And I, you know, the, we talk about barriers to care. Uh, we, we've talked about a lot today and I think it's concerning. And, you know, I wonder, you know, NAMI is doing a fantastic job of, of what it's done over the decades to advocate for those individuals uh, who have uh, uh, a mental health uh, issue that impacts them in a great way, uh, I think we're maybe helpful. And I'm wondering how often do you guys partner with, and I'm sure you do like NASW, the ACA, APA, both for psychologists and psychiatrists to unify around telehealth, to unify around these other things so that we're all trying to service the same thing or whether it's about Medicaid. I think our voices would be very loud and I don't see how we wouldn't be able to force change. What has been your experience with bringing coalition together like that? We, we work in co, go ahead, Nikki. We, 
I'm 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 a member of so many coalitions. Um, we're currently working with our CPA Rehabilitative Community Providers Association across Pennsylvania for a budget advocacy campaign. Um, as we all know, the budget is a huge hot topic right now. Um, although everything has been flat funded, we are seeing cuts in community service programming, and mm -hmm. that's huge right now. And um, you know. NAMI, NAMI provides that sort of programming and, and it would just be a shame given everything that's happening if we were no longer able to do those sorts of things, offer our virtual support groups, offer education classes for family members and peers, offer um, advocacy opportunities. Um, you know, we, we do mental health advanced directives out of the NAMI Keystone PA. You know, that's part of our adult mental health advocacy program. So. Um, you know, those are the types of coalitions we serve on. The Allegheny Coalition, um, excuse me, ACCR, Allegheny County Coalition for Recovery. There we go. Um, you know, it, that's a peer organization. It, and a large part of that is education and advocacy and educating people about mental health and mental health issues and the treatments that, and services that are available within the county. Uh, they actually recently, they're in the process of taking out a uh, media campaign that will be on Pittsburgh public transportation. So it'll be on the T, it'll be on the bus. Um, so pretty excited about that. Um, so those are just, a, that's a small snippet. Um, I've even assisted in forming a coalition recently, the PA advocates for whole health and wellness. Um, you know, there's there's a big focus within the state to move to integrated physical and behavioral health care because of the social determinants of health. So, um, you know, a couple of us other advocacy organizations joined together to kind of make sure that we're part of that planning process, nothing about us without us, so. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of that. I think that this has been a wonderful um, conversation regarding breaking down barriers, access to care, advocacy, and I'm sure our listeners will really um, find the things uh, very, you know, wonderful that you've shared with us today. So thank you, ladies, for both being with us, Chris and Nikki. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you for having us. Awesome. And, and thank you to the listeners of The Barrier Breakdown. We will see you on next week's episode, and we all hope that you stay safe and healthy. Take care. Thank you for listening to The Barrier Breakdown, Disrupting Mental Health. Listeners can find all of our episodes on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Podbean. For more information and to learn about upcoming continuing education events, check out our website, cbicenterforeducation.com, our Facebook pages, Cognitive Behavior Institute, and CBI Center for Education, as well as our Instagram at Cognitive Behavior Institute, and our Twitter at CBI underscore Pittsburgh. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. We hope you'll tune in for another guest next week.